Also, good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues and friends. It is a great honor and uh, pleasure for me to welcome you to the kickoff event of our online discussion series, Ground Check. And please allow me uh, to start my really short introduction to the topic with a small example and to pictures. You know, when the architect Friedrich Hinkel photographed, for example, Meroe's pyramids in Sudan in the 1980s, he saw intact and decorated stone surfaces. 35 years after Hinkel's photographs, you can see that the pyramids have lost most of their decoration and sharp edges. The sand of the desert has eroded the surface, uh, something like a, like a sand blasting machine. Well, in old photographs, only a little drifting sand can be seen today. The pyramids are swallowed by enormous sand dunes. You see that the UNESCO World Heritage Site is in serious danger. And this month, the site is also threatened by a Nile flood, which is unusually high this year. It is a new danger for Meroe as an archaeological site. But what is the reason for the two extremes, the spreading of the desert and the flooding? What influence does human intervention on the ground have and had? And which role plays the global climate change? Intensive agricultural use together with several dry periods has changed the landscape in this part of Sudan since the 1960s. Overgrazing promoted, promoted desertification, leading to a loss of vegetation, which held back the sand. So on the one hand, the desertification is a local event caused by human actions. But on the other hand, global warming also promotes aridization and desertification. The question for our time, as well as the past, is how are human intervention and the global and local changes in environmental conditions connected? This question is currently intensively discussed in connection with the introduction of the term Anthropocene for a new man-made age. Man shapes nature, intervenes in it, and changes it in a way that has never been seen before in history of the Earth. Man has become the influencing factor on geological, biological, and atmospheric processes on Earth. But when did the Anthropocene begin? With the industrialization in the 19th century, in the post-war period of the 20th century, or when people began to intervene more deeply in their environment through agriculture and animal husbandry, that would mean in the Neolithic period, for example, round about the 6th millennium BC. With the term ground check, uh, our online discussions focus on the local triggers and ramifications of environmental and climate change. We will analyze during the following uh, meetings, local terrestrial environmental data and their dependence on human intervention and global change. And we will analyze these complex relationships in great temporal depths. And this is the only way to understand the causes and effects that lead to change. Scientists and scholars of different disciplines and from all over the world will discuss the topic during our next six meetings. The spectrum ranges from natural sciences to humanities. Our opinion is that research into the past provides key data for understanding global climate change and its consequences for cultural heritage. It lays a foundation for developing sustainable solutions for the future. And this is also the goal we set for our discussions, our ground check. Originally, we planned to meet physically in Berlin in March this year for three days. Now we are meeting in this Zoom way virtually and have restructured the program to six evening sessions, as you can see on the picture. Today, we begin with the topic from model to impact the reconstruction of past, past climate changes and the consequences. On September 30th, we will look into the path with uh, the impact of climate change on early cultures. On October the 7th, we will discuss the topic water management and desertification, one of the most challenging issues for many regions of the world. On October 14th and 21st, 
we focus the focus our focus lies on the impact of climate change on cultural heritage as the conference is now spread over many evenings we will end with a final discussion and summary on october 29th to bring together the various contributions but now i do not want to hold any more of your time and attention with my introduction I want to thank all participants for joining us from all over the world in order to conduct a ground check from their scientific perspective. I would like to thank the Federal Foreign Office and the German Parliament for supporting the ground check research program launched this year. And I would like to express my special thanks to my colleagues from the German Archaeological Institute and the Archaeological Heritage Network for the organization. And lastly, I would like to thank the renowned science journalist Volkert Wildermuth for serving as the moderator for all six sessions of our conference and uh, who will now uh, introduce today's topics and speakers, to, panelists to you. And I hand over to you, Volkert. Thank you very much for your attention. So thanks again for the introduction, Professor Fliss. So past societies had to cope with climate change and all the, we are all descendants of people who were quite successful in this task. So there must be lessons to be learned from the perspectives of archeology. span And I can tell you in my talks with the speakers, I've already learned a great deal. Climate change, we all experience it or describe it as a global phenomenon, but the challenges it proposes for people are always local and therefore, the ground check discussions will focus on how changing climate plays out in very different settings and societies. Our first discussion is titled From Model to Impact, Reconstructions of Past Climate Changes and Their Consequences. And we will look at the data. How can we know about the fluctuation of local climate, the responses of plants and how people cope with the waxing and waning of their resources? We will start off with four short presentations. Then there will be a discussion among the speakers on the panel. And finally, all of you can ask your questions either using the chat function within Zoom or on Facebook or Twitter. But now let me introduce our speaker for the day. There's Professor Hans Rudolf Borg. He's a geographer based at the University of Kiel and a member of the cluster of excellence roots social, environmental, and cultural connectivities in past societies. He looks for signs of dramatic climatic, climate events in the landscape. Paleontologist Professor Pavel Tarasov is a specialist for pollen and tree ring dating from the working group Paleobotany, Paleoclimatology, Human Environment Interactions at the Freie University of Berlin. Paleobotanist Michel Dinies is his colleague at the same institute of the Freie Universität Berlin, and she looks at Poland as well, but in quite different settings. Finally, archaeologist Professor Detlef Grunenborn, he's a deputy head of the Competence Center Prehistory at the römisch germanisches Zentralmuseum in Mainz. He looks for developmental trajectories driven not by climate, by, but by factors within society. To start off, we will go not too back, far back in history. There are documents from the year 1342, two of heavy rains, devastating floods. However, are these exaggeration or are these accurate reports? Professor Hans Rudolf Borg, how deep had you to dig to find the answers to these questions? So thank you very much for, for this uh, introduction. And uh, just let me start with a very short PowerPoint presentation. Um, I want to concentrate uh, on just one event. So climate is the average change of weather over decades. Let me pick up just one element of this climate, one extreme event which happened uh, occurred in the 14th century. So several years ago, uh, we carried out your archaeological research south of the Harz Mountains uh, in the landscape Unter Eichsfeld, east of Göttingen. And um, in a huge excavation about 12, 13 meters deep, we found the filling of a gully. You will realize it here in this little sketch. Um, 
which was about 10 meters deep and from side to side, this is a cross section parallel to the slope, we found filled gully by filled gully. And at the bottom of the filling, there were some pottery fragments which we could date uh, into late medieval times. And then we continued to investigate more and more profiles in the region and more and more pottery fragments uh, and other material was found to date the event, the one event that cut these deep gullies. And finally, we came to the period 1330 to 1350. And now in the next step, we had a look at the written sources that were available. And they clearly show there is only one extraordinary intensive event in late middle, medieval times. And that started at the 19th of July in the year 1342 in Franconia, so in southeastern Germany. And then this extreme rainfall went to the northwestern Germany and brought a really unusual intensity of rainfall, of runoff, and thus of erosion. Just to illustrate how extreme the floods, the flood was, when you compare it with a major flood of the River Oder in 1997 or with the Elbe floods in 2002 and 2015, in 1342, the water which passed the major rivers in central Germany was 50 to 100 times more compared with the more recent events. So something extraordinary happened and about 13 billion tons of soils were eroded reducing the soil fertility dramatically. So many fields couldn't be used any longer. And then a few years later, the bubonic plague came in. And just to be in a correct order, I first have to mention that we have had a high population density at high medieval times, very intensive land use, often an unbalanced diet, and then the first extreme weather period, 1309 to 1321, the Dante anomaly. Then the rainfall I just mentioned shortly with strong erosion, the devastation of arable land, and then a bubonic plague from 1342 to 51. So the population density was dramatically reduced. We could show, we can prove in our profiles that there was a wide abandonment of agricultural land use and new woodlands started to grow in the late 14th and the 15th century. So overall, the area which was covered with woodland in Germany tripled and people started to keep namely pigs and cattle and other animals in the new woodlands and that enabled a change in diet. So all these uh, aspects of uh, this extreme period in the 14th century illustrate the very complex interaction between human activity, intensive land use, and extreme weather events. Thank you. So this was one devastating event, but climate change often develops not in a single event, but over a longer time period. And now we look at such developments and we go back deeper in time to the mid Holocene. Climate events by of this time can be reconstructed using biological proxies, tree rings, ancient pollen. Paleontologist Pro Professor Tarasov will focus on two regions in China. Do pollen help you not only to follow the climate, but the human reactions as well? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for introduction. And good afternoon, uh, dear friends and colleagues. So let me uh, start to uh, uh, introduce our research, uh, which has been done in cooperation with a big group of uh, colleagues and students all over the world. And uh, so just to indicate that this is not my result of the single research, but the results of the big uh, group where I, with uh, people whom I uh, had the pleasure to work with. Uh, well, the discussion of man and climate uh, is uh, not new, but if we are thinking about these two uh, phenomenon, we can always say that man and climate went together through their history, simply because 
there doesn't matter where you are living, where in which time and which place, you are always dealing with a certain weather and certain climate. Uh, there are some theories even uh, saying that uh, climate change and its effect on the ecosystem played a very important a key role in the human evolution. And on this picture, you see the uh, uh, certain proxies, so the environmental proxies from the African continent and surrounding seas. And you see the very strong trend toward the uh, dryness over the last four million years. And uh, this uh, change in the environments and climate also uh, somehow uh, parallel is parallel to the uh, development in the human family and the final evolution of uh, uh, Homo sapiens, anatomically modern man. Well, what we can learn from the past? We know that the station, meteor station around the world show a clear trend towards global warming. But this data only covers the last 100 to 150 years at best. On the other hand, various indicators, for example, plant pollen records, which I'm working with, can archive climate characteristics of the entire pre-industrial period of human history. Uh, I told that I'm working with pollen of plants, and uh, this is, of course, a very powerful proxy. I would like briefly uh, introduce you and say what is the secret of the pollen power. Pollen grains are very abundant. This knows everyone who has a car in Germany, especially the early summer or who has a pollen allergy. The pollen grains uh, are representative, so they are everywhere where plants are growing. They are well spread. That's why they are very common in the lake and mire sediments. So this is uh, very important for paleontologists. Pollen grains are very resistant because of the very uh, resistant uh, cover. They can survive in the sediments for millions of years, not only of thousands. And what is also important pollen grains produced by different plant taxa are recognizable. And here on this example, you see just a three uh, grains representing grasses, pine trees, and birch trees. And it's already for non-specialists understandable that they are very recognizable, very special in their shape. So all these features of pollen allow very reliable reconstructions of vegetation and land use, but also modeling of the vegetation communities and the land use, and last not least, quantitative climate reconstruction. I must tell that the work between sampling of the sediment core in the lake or peat uh, bog uh, is, and uh, uh, between the sampling and getting the final result is very long and very hard. So it's including uh, a lot of time and a lot of work. You see here, well, on this slide, it's shown very simple. But in fact, uh, in order to uh, extract pollen from the sediment and then count three to 500 grains per sample, it takes a lot of work. So we need to be patient and we need to be grateful to the people who are doing this. Uh, talking about the reconstructing the past, uh, well, the concept, the model of the reconstructing the past from pollen is very simple. Uh, climate is determ uh, determining factor for the vegetation in every given region. And the vegetation, of course, produce this particular pollen grains. So if we counted the pollen grain in the sample and uh, realized what is the composition of the taxa. We can reconstruct the vegetation and then reconstruct the climate. By the way, 100 years ago, Vladimir Köppen, famous climate researcher in Germany, said that native vegetation is the best expression of climate. Now we are coming to uh, two examples, uh, short examples 
uh, they are coming from Eastern Asia. You see the territory of uh, East Asia, China, and uh, the site Taishijuan is just located on the, uh, on the uh, range of the dry belt of the Northern Hemisphere, indicated here in yellow color. The site now, it's actually desert-like. You see the sand on the surface, but it was not always the same. And uh, this, what we can see from this pollen record of the Taishijuan peat, you see between six and 2,000 years ago, we have sometimes the amount of uh, pollen grains produced by trees up to 90%. But this changed very quickly between three and a half and 3,000 years ago. And using the pollen data, we can reconstruct the change from the temporary deciduous forest to the forest steppe and to the steppe environments through the uh, period between six and four and 2,000 years ago. This was corresponding uh, to a decrease in the rain, uh, annual rainfall from 600 millimeter to the below the present level, about 300 millimeter per year. And well, we can say who was the reason for this? What was the reason for this change in the vegetation? Human or uh, climate? Well, com comparing the record with the uh, record of um, isotope data from the Chinese Talagmite cave show that the actually reconstructed change in vegetation and precipitation is parallel to the weakening of the summer monsoon in this area. So weakening of the summer monsoon caused the change in precipitation, change in the vegetation, and then this change a few hundred years later caused a big change in the regional economy from the millet agriculture and fortified settlement to their field, uh, to their uh, abrupt uh, change to more husbandry and the mobile pastoralism. So coming to another example, which is 1,500 kilometers to the south from Taiji Juan site, you see here, this is a Taiwan uh, island, and the site is completely different. You see the forested landscape, the green fields. Well, this area is controlled by the monsoon today. It's obtained 1700 millimeter precipitation per year. When we are looking the change in the pollen profile through the last 10 and a half thousand years, we see a very similar picture in general. Quite a high content of tree pollen during the period between 10,000 and 3,000 years ago, and then the abrupt change towards the very few pollen of trees. And uh, this, of course, if we are reconstructing the vegetation, is telling us that there was a big change from natural warm temperate broadleaf forest in the area to the open woodland. If we are looking on the uh, uh, data of the uh, monsoon, the Pacific summer monsoon changes. Well, this is the same picture you have already seen. And uh, well, the very low, very weak monsoon precipitation is slightly later, about 2000 years ago. But earlier, we see a big dramatic increase in the number of sites, archeological sites in the area, and then continuous growth of population in the Fujian province where this site is located. So we see again the same question, climate or man? In this case, it's a different answer. We see the big, quick change in the economy in the region from the very few hunter-gatherer living in the area through the several millennia or many millennia before 3,000 years ago and then immigration of the agriculturalist starting of intensive uh, roading the forest and the uh, so forest clearance and the rice agriculture 
after 3,000 years ago. So in this case, men is a primary factor for changes in the environment. We see the last slide, complex problem with no simple answers. What do we need for addressing it successfully? So first of all, you have seen that we need a joint effort of archeologists and geoscientists. We need a suitable archives and reconstruction methods, and we need a robust dating or chronological control from both sides in order to discuss these changes uh, consistently. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we've heard that not only climate change, but humans can change landscapes in history as well. We now move a little bit to the west, to the Sahara Desert here in the plains. Paleobotanist Paleo Michel Diniz is seeing as well influences not only of environmental change, but of cultural interactions as well. We all know the Sahara is the world's biggest desert, but how did it look 8,000 years ago? 6,000 years ago, sorry. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Now then, um, Pavel Tarasov just told very nice how pollen are very useful tool to reconstruct climate change and at the same time to reconstruct human land use. And um, now we want to show you an example of the desert of the Sahara. So this is a um, picture of the actual Sahara, but as you all know, the Sahara was green some um, thousand years ago. Here you see the um, Sahara as it is today in a simulation with the large desert here and the savanna and the grasslands. And here you see a simulation of the green Sahara. Here you see how the um, savanna woodlands spread to the north and the grasslands too. And what we are doing now in our project at the moment is we are doing a ground check uh, regionally in the central Sahara. And we do this by analyzing a sediment core, similarly like Pavel Tarasov does it with his crew, but we do it out of the Lake Yua here in the central, situated here in the central Sahara. And here you see the nicely laminated sediment. So we are able to um, deal with one um, of the things Pavel just mentioned to build up a um, robust chronology. And um, we are doing poem analysis as, uh, on these cores too. And here you see a poem diagram. Don't worry, I won't go into any detail just to show you how the data looks like um, and which we did use afterwards the climate reconstruction and the land, land use reconstruction. So just one glance, here is um, the poem diagram and it starts about 10,000 years ago and it ends today. And here you see a few selected pollen types representing different um, vegetation formations and they are a little bit color coded. So you see in yellow here the desert vegetation, here the semi-desert vegetation in orange, the um, savanna more dry adapted and here the real green savanna from the Green Sahara. But as I said, we won't go into detail. And what we were looking now is on the aridification. So we don't look how it became green, but how it turned to the desert as it is today. And um, to make it more easily to understand, these uh, three photos may give a sketchy impression what really happened in the Sahara. So we have the savanna and then the aridization until the desert today. And of course, you can imagine that these um, dramatical environmental changes um, um, necessitated adaptations or required adaptations for plants, animals, and people. Yes, and the most common thing and wh what we think always about is the migration. Yes, so people and plants and animals go in other places that are adequate for them. But of course, concentration on remaining favorable sites, such as oases, is another possible adaptation. And of course, humans can do other things such like um, social for transforming social systems. This, of course, we can't trace in the pollen record, but um, we can trace the changing subsystems strategies. Um, for example, the cultivation of um, different crop, crop plants or fruit trees and things like that. 
And as I just mentioned, if we look um, on, on um, the cultivation in deserts, the places where it usually took place are oases. And oases can be quite different. As you can see here, they are nearly natural oases. Then there are culti oases where cultivation is intensely done. For example, the date palm cultivation without irrigation at some oases or with irrigation. And here you can even see a very extreme thing. It's a completely artificial oasis where fossil groundwater is uh, pumped up and then an oasis is created. But going back to the history of the aridification and the oasis as possible places where adaptions could take place, we may ask the questions, is there something like an oasis packet that spread synchronously with aridization. That would mean, um, is there a pattern that when it becomes more arid, the same things happened in oases. And here we want to show you only two um, different, the results of two different um, oases we are investigating at the moment. The one is the Lake Yua I just presented you in the central Sahara in the northern part of the Chad. And the other for comparison is the oasis of Taima in northwestern Saudi Arabia. And if we go back in time by our pole diagrams and put it in this picture here, you can see the following thing. If we go back 4,000 years before Christ, you see that at the oasis of Taima, Taima was already an oasis, there it was dry, it was surrounded by a desert trap vegetation, and their grapes wine were cultivated. They were imported from the north and were cultivated. If we look at the same time to our um, Lake Yua, you see Lake Yua wasn't an oasis at that time, yes? It was a lake surrounded by a savanna. If we go further in time to about thousand years before Christ, you see that at the oasis of Taima here, there was cultivation of the grape, grape wines and there was a cultivation of a lot of other typical oasis trees like the date palm or the pomegranate. The same you can record in another oasis in the Sahara, the Jama oasis, date palm, grapes and pomegranates were cultivated together with other fruit trees. And now if we look at Yua, you see it's an oasis now. The lake is surrounded by desert vegetation, but no food trees could, cultivation could be traced thousand before Christ. If we look at the time slice at 500 after Christ, you see that at the oasis of Taima and at the oasis of Germa, the food tree cultivation continued, a large spectrum. And at Yua, we saw a little bit date palm cultivation, but mainly a propagation of a native palm, the dude palm. And it was only thousand after Christ, thousand years before present, that the date palm cultivation was very important, similar to other oases, such as Taima. Thus, um, if we go back to the question, if um, we can see a general adaptation pattern to aridization in the Sahara Arabian Belt, we may see that the oases become much more important during this aridization, but there seems to be no standardized answer to these environmental constraints. In, in con contraire, uh, uh, you see very um, strong regional differences and possible adaptations. Yeah. Thank you. This was one hint that not only climate change, but the cultures dealing with climate change are very important as well. And this goes nicely over to the talk of archaeologist Detlef Grunborn. He developed a model of the development of society's trajectories, which are driven by processes within these societies. So how does your model work? I will talk about a very remote period. Uh, nevertheless, one of the most important uh, periods in global history with a focus on um, Europe or rather on Central Europe, um, namely the period when um, people changed from a hunting and gathering lifestyle to a farming lifestyle. Um, which um, for our region here happened um, at, at, uh, at the end of the last glaciation 
uh, in the so-called Fertile Crescent. And from there, um, from there on, people migrated outwards with this new technology. We will specifically look at the green blurb in the middle, namely um, at the region of Western Central Europe. A few words need to be um, addressed, however, to our theoretical model. It is sort of based on something that has been derived uh, lastly from psychology and then made its way into the environmental sciences, namely the adaptive cycle model. It is shown in the right with a sort of eight-shaped or eternal-shaped um, 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 confusing um, uh, progression. Um, for our purpose, we have simplified it a little bit um, and uh, stretched it out and put it into a two-dimensional, uh, two-dimensional, um, two-dimensional scheme with, with, with which archaeologists and historical uh, or historians are more uh, familiar with. Uh, one component of this um, eight-shaped um, model, uh, one component that sort of forces the progression within the model is a factor which is called resilience or sort of the, um, the span between resilience and vulnerability. Uh, we have sort of broken up this resilience concept and added it to what we call the complexity, um, the complexity um, um, uh, parameter. Uh, however, resilience is still there. Um, one problem that most of the theoreticians and most of the archaeologists and historians have had with the model um, and with the adaptability of the model is if we think in terms of resilience, which is very helpful, uh, we need, however, nevertheless, uh, get away from the intuitive metaphor that the, the term is. So we need to find in the archaeological or in the historical record, we need to find signals that can be quantifiable and that hopefully stretch over a long period of time that sort of give us a help of coming to grips with this intuitive metaphor, adding, so to speak, a firm data to it. Um, we have looked at a variety of archaeological signals. Uh, there are many out there. And we have come to the conclusion that pottery decoration is one of the best uh, signal carriers for, um, for resilience, or rather for the factor that comes out of resilience or that, that expresses resilience even better for social cohesion. Because we think, I can explain the theoretical background later on, we think that um, resilience is sort of produced by fluctuations in social cohesion. Resilience can be produced by many other factors as well, but maybe one of the most effective and most dominant one are fluctuations in social cohesion. Those that deal with long-term history have know that since the beginning of, of, of classical antiquity, uh, and, and antiquity um, histor antique, classical antique historiography, social cohesion is being considered in theoretical models. Um, and so we do still today. So we need to find something that expresses fluctuation social cohesion in the archaeological record. And we think that pottery decoration is a good signal for that because people indicate their social identity with pottery decorations and changes in this temporal changes in this um, in this um, in, 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 in this um, pottery decorations indicate changes in the way people identify with themselves and on various scales with these societies. So basically what we look, we look at changes in pottery decoration and interpret them in the way that they reflect changes in social cohesion. With these time series that, do, that we produce, um, we go and talk to the paleoclimatologists. Uh, for us, uh, it is always, well, if, if you deal with paleoclimatology uh, on a high-resolution high level, it is good to look at very local uh, sources, sources that reflect the local climate. And for us here in our area, we look mostly at uh, the Sauerland um, 
Sauerland records from the Bunker Cave, which is, uh, has a high chronological resolution and gives us some indicator on precipitation and um, in, in, uh, yeah, in more or less more or less also temperature. So these uh, two records we compare uh, and we look um, at um, the first uh, farming societies that we have in our area, the so-called linear pottery culture. We know from 150 years of research, it's a simple farming society. We know it is lineage based. Uh, people lived in dispersed settlements and um, the people had no marked hierarchy. So they're basically simple farmers with an very effective um, farming system. They have built hundreds and hundreds of settlements. So we have a very dense uh, data system. With the method that I, um, that I explained before, we are able to derive at scaled curves of what we interpret as changes in social cohesion. So you see the orange curve and the yellow curve. These are basically changes in the diversity of pottery styles, which we interpret as changes in social cohesion. And we compare these with population estimations. And we see that some of the social cohesion fluctuations correspond quite well with the population, um, with the population curve, uh, but others at a higher level do not. They sort of take their own, uh, their own dynamic. And we also compare um, these population curves and the, uh, and the curves of uh, social cohesion with the paleoclimatic curves. And we can see sort of that all curves generally follow um, the, generally follow the, uh, uh, the indications of the climate curve, but that there are certain deviations. For instance, the um, general curve up here um, only coarsely corresponds to the climate curves. Um, uh, but the, uh, uh, the curve at the lower level um, corresponds to some climate excursions, but not to, not to others. And this can be repeated for the middle Neolithic and actually for another cycle, which will be too difficult uh, to, um, um, uh, to talk about because it would extend the presentation too much. Um, one thing that needs to be stressed from this curve and other curves is that not only when climate turns bad has an effect on these society, but also when climate turns good. So we see a diversification increase or, an in, or a change in social cohesion towards more diversification when the weather presumably gets better and also we see changes in population curves when the climate gets more drier. And then at the end, when it gets back to humid and wet and cold, we see all curves declining. So it's sort of a, a constant feedback between positive and negative effects that produce um, these curves. Okay. Lastly, I uh, should say- Societies react to the climate, but they have their own dynamics as well. Societies react to the climate, but they have their own internal dynamics as well. And what one thing is that strikes us most is that um, when people become more and more, hence one would think they're doing much better, uh, they begin warring for no reason. So we think that societies, um, that societies undergo an internal dynamic which ultimately le leads to their um, to their own disintegration because other colleagues that have applied the same method in regions um, where the climate is rather heter uh, rather homogeneous find the same curve progression but no real general link to climate so we think that the social cohesion curves is something that is a given and climate operates as an incoming external factor, shortening or widening the extension of these curves. Um, how, uh, societies on the world generally do get better. So we have a lot of population, a lot of technology. So we are at the end of this internal cycle. Maybe we can try to bring 
the other participants back into the discussion. And I will want to mention that all of you, all of the people listening to the discussion can join in using the Zoom chat function or using Facebook, using Twitter, whatever. When we look at your different presentations, they are all, we see that this global phenomenon of climate change plays out very differently in different settings. So is there any possibility to link these data dots we have on the interaction between people and climate, regional climate in the past into a bigger story? Are mathematical models, for example, one way to try to integrate your stories into the broader picture? Yeah, just to, to give you an example, um, <clears throat> when we have um, a lot of uh, sites investigated, we have just individual often contradicting results for certain periods and for the sites and often with quite different conclusions. And uh, <clears throat> to integrate all that, we have a lot of tools and very different types of models. So for example, <clears throat> we can regionalize uh, these information, this point data or site data using recent information about the topography, so the relief, the slope angle, um, about the recent soil conditions and land use and see if there are any correlations between the recent situation and the different past situations. So th by that we can check if our conceptual models fit or if we have to develop them further on. So this is one possibility, more a geographical method to come from the point in the three spatial dimensions and then adding the time as a fourth dimension. The other possibility of modeling is in all available scales from a point to the whole earth land surface that we use mechanistic models, just to give an example, how a raindrop passes the soil to the groundwater over a spring into the rivers or when it's a heavy rainfall directly over the surface um, to the rivers then and all attached material chemicals so nutrients and uh, so on and also this recent modeling helps us to understand better the processes that uh, occurred in the past so we have a huge variety uh, of models that have has shown uh, one great example, and uh, I just added a few more of this huge box uh, that we have there of modeling. Do you use models as well in your research? Michel Dinius or Professor Tarasso? Uh, yes, I can, uh, I can tell also, I mean, if to think the ancient Greeks philosopher uh, told that uh, you cannot two times step in the same river. And this is also true for our research. So when we're asking what can we learn from the past? So uh, uh, we can learn the number of scenarios which are then allowing us or modern scientists doing the complex models to test these models in order to say, okay, this model is good for, prog for, for the uh, uh, prognosis of the future scenario or development of the climate change and the, and the impact of the uh, climate change on the ecosystem, we need to say which of these 100 models is better or which is, uh, well, very good and uh, just uh, can be trusted and, uh, and, and so on. So in order to test the models, we are, frequently asked uh, by the modeling community to provide uh, our on-site research results, reconstructions in the site A, B, C, and so on. And uh, this data is very useful for, for testing the model and uh, to make then necessary changes in the modeling uh, procedure in order to, to get the better results. Yeah, you see, if we are successful with a model to, to simulate the past, we can also be more or less confident 
that it's uh, simulate the future. So this is uh, our contribution to the models. Just one sentence, I think, too. Um, we are working, for example, with the modelers in, in, um, in, in Hamburg together. And um, as Pavel Tarasov said, they often come to us to validate their models. And I think it's great to model things. But there are big challenges, too. For example, if vegetation modeling is done, usually they reduce the plants to trees, shrubs, and grass. Yeah? And so the world is much more complex. Yeah? So I think modeling is great, and it gives a lot of input and ideas in which we can think. But um, uh, yes, most of the time, it's a reduction yes, um, at the same time. And I think that's a, a big challenge. Uh, we, we, we can try to interact um, more and um, Yes, we can profit more both times. And um, I don't know if it's the same for you, Pavel Tarasov, but sometimes, as you said, we sit there and count for years a poem diagram, and the modelers say, just do one, they press one button and model the world and explain the world. And um, yes, there, there are sometimes a little bit uh, uh, differences, and, and we are sometimes discussing very heavily, uh, no, not in this direction. And but this is a common problem, yeah, to, yeah. to have a, a communication, a general understanding between the different groups of scientists. For this, this meeting is very, very important and very good, because, yeah, climate modelers are saying we need a data set. Archaeologists are saying, oh, you are talking about the region, but we are working on one side. We need this real local data. So there is a uh, such problem of understanding, but only through the really collaborative research, we can uh, deal with such problems and solve them very successfully. So I wonder when we talk about how people in ancient times reacted to climate change and cope with climate change, what is the right level to look at their environment? Is this landscape as Professor Borg discussed, or is it the very local profile of rain, or is it the biomass in the region, the available resources? So what is the level where climate really becomes a force in the life of people in past societies? Yeah, well, with these two examples I, I just presented, it was very clear that there is a climate change which is the same in the large region. We have a reduction in the, in the rain, but in one region, this reduction of the rain uh, is bringing uh, actually a big change in the vegetation towards the desert and the people, or to, towards the dry steppe, and the people are changing their economy from the agriculture to pastoralism. And in the other region, the same decrease in the precipitation was actually favorable for uh, societies dealing with uh, rice farming to come to this area because before it was simply too much rain. Even now, you know, in this Southeast China, uh, we know this from the news, this terrenous rains and the floods are very, very big problem. But if we have even stronger monsoon, more, more rain, uh, then it was actually very difficult to keep the fields and, and, and to live there. So that for many thousand years, the hunter-gatherers uh, lived more successfully there with their economy than the agriculturists. Even the ancient region of rice agriculture was just a few hundred kilometers away from this site. Yeah, see. So climate change is a very local phenomenon. So when you all look at your different data sets, there seems to be, on the one hand, there's climate change, different um, plants cropping up or different possibilities showing up for people. And on the other hand, there are these cultural processes within societies that Professor Grunenborn described. Do you see these cultural reaction to climate change as well. I think, Michel Dinius, you said in your OASIS systems, there were quite different cultural reactions to the same kind of change in the availability of water. 
Yes, um, so we can, um, I think for archaeologists, we don't see really the cultural change because we see only the changes in subsistence strategies. Yeah, so that's our indicator um, to approach the things. But yes, there we see um, huge differences um, and we see really regional answers. And the, but they probably were connected to um, bigger cultural phenomena. So, for, for example, the oases that were very early cultivated, they are intensely connected and um, part of um, 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 ah, how the trade routes. Yes, and um, for example, Lake Yua, the oasis who stayed really <laughs> autonome and were not cultivated before um, thousand years ago. So it's really in the center of the Sahara and no big trade routes went through it um, in, in earlier, uh, so um, uh, only in the last centuries it started to get integrated. So I think this, uh, we can see both. Huh? We can see um, regional answers like the native dead palms that are used, and we can see probably um, changes that are linked to cultural processes um, from outside coming to the to the oasis. Yeah. And a question to all of you: What do you think can our societies today learn from the reactions and interactions of past societies with? climate change. So are there lessons from the past for today? Yeah. Professor Borg? Just one, one example, if we just pick up um, the extreme events again, uh, different sites are very different vulnerable. So when we check how the people reacted in the past and which extreme climate events we have had, very often the situation is quite similar today. So which areas are very prone to catastrophes, let us say hilly less areas, much more than a sandstone hilly region or whatever. So we can take a lot of information from the past for the today, for example, landscape planning, how uh, we should develop uh, new settlement areas or industrial areas and where it's better not to develop them. So this is just one example. Professor Grunbaum? One difficulty I have with um, looking at our current global situation from the past is that, and we've just learned it this year, um, that our climate change is unparalleled in any part of human history. It goes faster, it goes to more extremes, and it's parallel across the globe. You know, previous scenarios, we had things happening here, things happening there, and societies were able to address these individually. But now we're faced on a global scale with a situation which has more or less gotten out of hand. So I'm, I'm not quite sure whether we can, I agree, you know, when it comes to local desertifications, we can look in the past and see how, pe how people have dealt with desertifications. Um, but on a global level, I'm, I'm not quite sure what, how we can benefit from the past because the past has always, uh, has never been that interconnected as we are as we are today. I think, I think the, the, the challenge is much bigger than anything that any society in the entire history of humans has ever faced. Well, that's a bit pessimistic, yeah. but... I would, I would like also to say uh, a few words about this. Well, we can learn a lot uh, from the uh, past, particularly from the past societies and past uh, examples. Uh, of the dealing with catastrophes from the uh, uh, local level management. You see, for example, we have a very uh, interesting study some years ago uh, dealing with uh, one village with what what partly destroyed by the by the uh, um, mud flow. So it was a catastrophic rain, and the mud flow destroyed the half of the village, and it was speculated. Uh, so in some houses where people found the skeletons of the of the people and the discussion what was this maybe a Pompeii like uh, or something but in fact it was a mud flow and interesting this was happened 4,000 years ago 
since that time when we made a modeling of the landscape with the students uh, from Potsdam and Berlin, we realized that people never built houses in this area, which was affected by the smart flow. So the village was there for thousand years, but uh, it was just a, a few hundred meters away from the place where the smart flow uh, destroyed the houses. So now, because people are, well, as uh, uh, Detlef told that uh, we are actually two uh, multicultural and so on, and the, the people who are building the houses in their own place, they are very often not living there, they are only getting money from the uh, people living in this place. Therefore, we have a lot of examples in the past years when such kind of, uh, as also Professor Borg told, such unsoughtful building or unsoughtful development of the certain area without uh, connection to the previous experience create a big troubles. So this we can learn, I think, also. A short uh, addition to that, what uh, Detlef said, uh, I agree totally uh, that uh, what is going to, to on today with climate change, uh, global change, uh, is incomparable um, in human uh, history. Nevertheless, in the past, there were certain events uh, which have had over-regional effects. Let's just take the late antique Little Ice Age. We're starting in October 536 AD. The sun wasn't shining for several years, and it is uh, reported in contemporary documents. There it was not warm as it is today. There it was very cold and wet and changing the game totally in most societies on Earth, maybe except the Chinese. So even from that, we can learn how a hemisphere may be affected in that case by climate change as a consequence of volcanic uh, eruptions in, 40, in 536 and in the following years. And there's a lot of population go down, got down, I think. So the lesson might not be a nice one. We now have the first question from the audience from Sabine Reinhold. She has a question for Professor Gronenborn. Um, what would you suppose from your case study and other sources about the offsets of resilience? How long does a traditional agro-pastoral society can keep its way of existence and economy under environmental pressure until they have to quit the area, migrate or break just down? All right, um, thank you for your kind words. I was just replying in writing, but uh, I can also, <laughs> I can also, um, um, I can also talk um, or rather read what I was just writing. Um, the method that we need to apply in the early Neolithic societies, etc., in Europe, does not allow us to go uh, to time spans shorter than 25, 20 to 25 years. So we, we also watch everything through, um, through a, a grade system uh, of 25 years. So we cannot say whether they reacted in a time period shorter than 25 years. Within these 25 years, we see rather immediate uh, reactions. But for those people back then, this was an entire generation. If we look at the ethnography worldwide, basically, of simple farming systems, we see that these people took decisions after three years. If an uh, uh, unfavorable situation persisted more than three years, uh, most of the storage was used up and they had to take decisions and change the strategies. And we presume this was the same for, um, for, uh, yeah, for the prehistoric European societies. You ask about agro-pastoral systems, that of course is a bit, a bit different because cattle uh, can be managed in other ways than, um, than harvests. But I presume two, three to five years is the limit for these simple farming or agro-pastoral societies. Does that help? Probably. <laughs> we have to wait for the next um, writing. I would like to ask 
it's really important the collaboration between natural scientists of, on the one hand and archaeologists on the other hand but you're dealing with quite different sets of data which are the the data of pollen uh, pollen or tree rings they are sometimes dated to the year on the other hand if you have to rely on cultural changes if you have to rely on the markings on pottery which change on different time scales so how easy how difficult is this for you talking together are there many misunderstandings or is the field now so open that there are easy discussion between these different subdisciplines yeah um, <clears throat> just to start um, of course, first we have to define the, the key terms that we know what we mean when we talk about uh, certain topics. Uh, but nevertheless, I think, namely for the archaeological uh, excavations uh, themselves, so for the normal archaeological work, uh, it is very fruitful when you have a cooperation with uh, very different natural scientists uh, from uh, botany, zoology, uh, from geophysics, from physical geography, and from paleoclimatology, because when they take samples on site, so at the archaeological sites uh, where villages or towns or cemeteries are investigated, you get really coherent data sets and a lot of improvements were made there in the last decades. I think at least uh, in, in, in Germany, in, in Europe, in Northern America, most excavations today are carried out together from archaeologists and the other disciplines. They are no longer, as we call it in Germany, the Hilfsdisziplinen, and so the helping disciplines just bringing in certain information from outside. No, today we are defining together the goals. <clears throat> we are defining together the methods that we are using and we are analyzing the data together and we are publishing together. So it's a lot of improvement that we have had in, in the past years on site. And of course, there is off-site investigation, some examples we have given uh, today in our short talks, where it's much more difficult to bring them together with the archaeological investigations. By the help of models, a lot is possible, as we have seen already. Thank you. Well, maybe I can also add a few words to this topic. Yeah, well, everything depends on the uh, wish to discuss things, to work together, of the understanding that Together, we can address the problem from different sides. But if we are talking about this, uh, well, comparison, the scale, annual or decadal or centennial, this is, of course, also a bilateral process. For example, we work together with a dendrochronologist from uh, German Archaeological Institute, uh, Dr. Hosner, and uh, the uh, by excavating together with Chinese colleagues uh, one uh, grave in a very uh, remote area of Western China, they found uh, a lot of wood which was used uh, from uh, uh, which was used uh, for constructing this uh, this grave. It was a maybe a kind of uh, noble uh, tomb or chief or king, local king. And uh, just investigating this archaeological material, uh, Uwe Hosna created the longest uh, tree ring chronology from the region going back to 2,600 years ago. And this, in turn, when he shared these results with, uh, with me, with us, uh, we were able to produce a curve of the annual rainfall for this area for the past 2,600 years. So this is how the communication, how the connection of the research, archaeology, and environmental science can bring a benefit to both of us, uh, to both sides. Yeah, this is, yeah. There's another question by Barbara Zach. Um, 
is it possible to parallel changes in pottery decoration with change in food crops or animal husbandry? So the connections within the cultures. Professor Grunenbaum. Yeah. Um, hello, Barbara. It's nice to hear from you again. Um, we've been to Africa together many, many years ago. Um, I, it, it is. Uh, it is uh, when you have high resolution paleobotanical data. But of course, this is seldom the case. But um, for the LBK, we are beginning to see structures. But I don't want to go into detail yet because it's research in progress. But it, it you know, it, it, it's only, it, it only works in in certain periods and times, and you need a lot of archaeological and paleobotanical data and the right, uh, the right preservation conditions. Are there any um, archaeological find pottery findings at the oasis you work with, Michelle Diniz? So um, uh, at Timer, yes, and I think there Arnulf Hausleiter in one of the next sessions would may, can um, talk a lot about um, because I'm a botanist. But unfortunately, at the oasis, for example, in, in Onyanga, it's very hard to do excavation there because of political and um, infrastructural reasons. So there really there is nearly nothing. And there we have the big problem that um, we have um, a rather high resolution archive for climate reconstruction landscape change, but the archaeological information is very from, from really over regional. Uh, um, yeah? So you have, of course, the herders and the, the cattle cults and things like this, yes, but um, that's a very rough chronology. And to put it really to, let's say, for example, we have the 8.2 event, uh, 8,000. 200 event in, in, in the Central Sahara, we can date up to, yes, hundreds of years or even 50 years. And then to put these large chronologies together, it's hard, yes. And so I think it's the challenging thing at, at the moment, people in the, for looking at cultural changes in the Sahara, um, they one fraction say, okay, um, the aridization um, was um, slowed down by the herders and the other fraction relying on the same data, they say, oh no, the herders accelerated aridification, yes? So if you don't have concrete um, phonological controls and hard facts really for a region together, data can use for <laughs> contrasting arguments. Huh? So that's at the moment, um, not only did the desert dry out suddenly or not, but the other thing is did herders um, prolonge the Green Sahara or did it um, shorten down? Yes, so the, yeah. So there's another question of the audience. This is from Sine. Um, she wants to ask, do you think that, uh, what do you think of the collaborative research with computer scientists? Do you think some common problems could be addressed? Have you already had collaborated with computer scientists and in which case studies? So Professor Bock? <clears throat> computer scientists are integrated more and more in the large uh, collaborative uh, projects today um, in very different ways, namely for the, the handling and the management of the big data problems uh, of very heterogeneous data sets uh, of modeling. So they are today a part in the larger projects at least. Yeah. Um, about 10 years ago, I, um, we had a publications with uh, um, um, mathematical modelers or computer scientists uh, that uh, showed that um, climate actually played a minor role in the expansion of farming. To our great surprise, we wanted to find out something totally different. But this is what the computer simulation uh, what the computer simulation suggested. It's, uh, it's published, I think, in the Journal of Archaeological Science. Yeah, well, uh, I think uh, another aspect of collaboration with a uh, with computer or IT uh, specialist, it's, uh, for example, to uh, extract the data from uh, a certain, uh, certain sources. For example, we uh, analyzed uh, 
about uh, 30 volumes of um, Chinese atlases of uh, archaeological sites. Uh, they were only maps. So it would be just a year if we are uh, digitalizing or trying to take side by side information from these maps, which even didn't have uh, coordinates. But uh, with a specialist writing the software, when we explained him what is the task of this project, he was well successful to create a software to get this information from the maps and we could publish several uh, good papers and uh, also provide this data for the open access use for the community. So this is an important uh, contribution. Another is in general, yeah, creating the software for certain purposes. Climate calibration, climate calculation is possible, of course, with uh, Excel or with certain uh, uh, software packages, but uh, it would be much more quicker and much more nicer when there is a, a software created specially for certain tasks. And this, uh, we are benefiting, of course, from such cooperation. I have to go back to Professor Grunenborn. You mentioned that the expansion of agriculture was not driven by favorable the climate. So what was the driver then? Just a short answer. Um, no, the, 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 it had a, a small scale effect. Um, it, well, judging from what, what I've just said and what I only now know, not back then, I think it were internal social dynamics. And of course, one big factor is population. Population has been debated over and over again, but we know it were many more people than before, and these people needed to make a living somewhere. And that, yeah, that together drove, and maybe also there's a factor of curiosity. Okay, this brings us to the next question by Ferran Antolin from Basel. He um, asks Dr. Dinez um, that he got the impression that the Saharan lakes and oasis only started to be dwelled at after aridification starts. Is this correct? And why would this be the case? Um, it's, um, I think perhaps I have to say um, there are not many oases investigated at the moment. Huh? So we have a very reduced picture, yes. But um, it seems that uh, at the moment, yes, that at least um, 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 cultivate uh, uh, crops like the date palm that are um, imported from outside and then cultivated some, somewhere. In the Nil Valley, it was very, very early, yes. And in satellite oasis, um, in the Dachla oasis, for example, or like this or Farfara, it started at about 4,000, yes. But um, the inner Saharan oasis, they seem to be very, very lately cultivated by crop plants. And it's even later in, in the um, Western part of the Sahara. And um, the hypothesis at the moment really is um, because there wasn't that much cultural connection and there was perhaps a larger variety, at least in the Western Sahara, um, perhaps um, plants native there, they could be used a little bit. Um, the old idea of the Garden of Eden that was there and that's why the people didn't um, um, start earlier, but as I said, it's very, very at the beginning, for example, the Garaman, uh, the, the Germa or as I, I showed before, it's really a Garamantan culture connected to the Roman afterwards, so that's a cultural thing, yes. Um, but in the Central Sahara, they, they perhaps didn't have the contacts or needed, didn't need things like this. Yeah, yeah. But it's at really at the beginning, at the beginning, and it's the same for the Arabian Peninsula. Huh? We were very astonished that they started very early cultivation because in other oases, the date palm comes there yes, only several, uh, much later than we expected. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, it's really um, research in progress. So I would invite the audience to ask further questions. We still have some minutes. So if you are interested in some aspects of the topics we discussed, now is the time to ask your questions. Um, one point 
I wonder is um, some of you work in locations where there are still people which um, live in similar conditions. So at the Oasis, for example. So are they interested in the work you do? Are they interested in their, this long view of their past? I think I should start. So unfortunately, I was never in the Saharan oasis until now, but I was there in the Saudi Arabian oasis, and there they don't live um, anymore traditionally, we have to say. Yeah, it's really um, much more industrial. And um, um, I, of course, talk to the botanical part of the things, and um, they, they were in interested and they were surprised about a lot of things. Yes, for example, the late arrival of the date palm for the Saudi Arabian people, it was um, a little bit of shock, yes, because it's the national tree, it's very important. Um, but I think they got more and more interested in and um, 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 it's not only exotic, yes, you know, and they looked how wood drilled and things like that. Yes, yeah? so there, there is an interest there, but I think it could be much more um, cooperation, uh, yes, people always try to do it and sometimes it's hard but often it works, yeah. Yeah, just another uh, example, <clears throat> we are carrying out some research on uh, Rapa Nui, which formerly was called Easter Island, uh, a part of Chile and the Eastern Pacific Ocean, and there the people are very, very interested in ecological and uh, paleoclimatological, paleoecological uh, research because they have a long tradition and long oral and detailed uh, oral tradition. While when we work on Palau, which is in the western part um, of the Pacific Ocean, today an independent uh, state, due to a very long colonial period, German, Japanese, US dominated colonial period, there's really a break and quite few knowledge about the past and uh, our investigations are now in uh, going on, but showing that we can improve the interest of uh, the people on wh where they are living on to understand really the landscape where they are living in. Um, and that, uh, that is quite fruitful when you have long-term corporations that with the years, the interest, the local interest, is often increasing very much in certain regions. I'm, I'm, apart from working in Africa, I'm also working, as I said, in Central Europe, um, villages and towns not so far away from here. And um, I should say I have found the most interest in people within our local societies. You know, people identify with the archeology, span even if it goes back several thousand years ago. Um, and I find a great interest on all levels of societies, from, from the farmers uh, to the educated people, but not necessarily uh, to all, um, all parts of society, and up to the politicians, even the state politicians, if they find the time for it. Um, I, um, I think archaeology is, is well received, as it is in Africa, of course. But um, also here, we should not underestimate our own people's interest in their own past as it is. Yeah. yeah. I also uh, maybe uh, say a few words. Uh, all experience of working in very remote areas uh, in, in Russia or in China or in Japan, uh, people are always interested in uh, the local people are very helpful. And uh, because they are interested in their past, they are always curious asking, eh, what did you find? What is, uh, what is all about? But they are also more and more interested in the help of scientists for environmental protection, for example. Yeah, when we are, we are saying, okay, we are geoscientists, we are working with the environments. Oh, well, maybe you can tell this, or maybe you can write this or say it loudly. We need here to, to do something, for example, to protect the Lake Baikal or to protect the forest and so on. You see, this is a, a very, very important part that the local people are very interested and very supportive. Yeah, so thank you to all the speakers on the panel. I think we've reached a good point to wrap this discussion up. We've learned a lot about 
different ways to really gather data from the past to learn about how people, how the environment of people, the landscape, people have to deal with changed and how fast it changed. But that is not only a factor of climate which drives cultures, but it can be the other way around that cultures drive, not the climate, but the development of the local landscapes we've seen in the example of Pavel Tarasso. So it's an interaction and climate seems not to be destiny, but something which can be dealt with in a way, at least it could be dealt with in the past. So this was our session today, but the ground check discussions will go on next week. We start discussion two. The subject will be impact of climate change on early cultures, case studies, and you can expect more de details from East Asia, from Anatolia, from several regions, from Africa. We will meet next week at the same time, six o'clock on the 30th of September, and at the same place, in the virtual place, the internet. Unfortunately, we can't meet face to face. But I want to thank the audience for the questions and the speakers for the insightful um, presentations. And I'm looking very much forward to the next discussion. Thank you.